Today I'm going to be talking about Appalachian language and phrases, specifically ones that start with the letter O. Now I'm using the Dictionary of Smoky Mountain English for reference. It's a great, great book, a great reference book for anyone who's interested in the language of Appalachia. The only problem is it's been out of print for a long time, so it's very expensive. However, in the last year, a new edition of it has been published, and the title of it is uh, Dictionary of Southern Appalachian English, and it's also excellent, and it's much more affordable, still pricey, but if you're someone that's into language like I am, but you can find it uh, on Amazon and also at the publisher's and I will put that information in the description below so that you can go if you were interested in getting it. But today I'm using the original version, which is the Dictionary of Smoky Mountain English. So the very first one we're going to start with is a, just a phrase, a very interesting one that I've really never heard, but I, I like it. So it's, oh, be joyful. So you think, oh, be joyful. Well, that sounds almost like a religious uh, connotation, and it certainly could be, oh, be joyful. But the dictionary lists it as that that is a noun for illegal moonshine, homemade whiskey. 1952, McCall, Cherokee and Pioneers. And if you are invited to share a little something, whether it be called moonshine, corn juice, nubbin booze, cane corn, white mule, stomp juice, white lightning, old nick, hoot owl, oh, be joyful, or Mountain Dew, you should be warned that the thing meant is that powerful rank pison what cheers the heart of even a man with a nagging wife. <laughs> so that's kind of kind of comical. But I've never heard uh, illegal moonshine or whiskey called OB Joyful, so that's interesting. The next one's interesting, so it's obliged, like I'm obliged, uh, that we might say. But the usage that the dictionary shares is that it was commonly said obliged with two E's in it, obliged. So I've never heard that. So it means obligated, of course. So let's see, 1905, Miles, Spirit of Mountains. If they had any business there that they have got obliged to tend to, they'd set out on the porch. 1939, Hall Collection, Proctor, North Carolina. I'm obliged to go home. Mostly old women use that word. You can hear it once in a while. That was Lawrence uh, Jones that said you could hear it sometimes. 1966, from Strangers. But I insisted that it was shoofs to down, and he was right obliged. So I've never heard it said like that. If you have, please, please share that. The next one is for a bean, October bean. That's like a dried bean. And we've grew that one in the past, but it's been many years ago. Uh, I would like to grow it. It's one of those things that you kind of leave it on the vine and, and so you don't harvest as much, not like the green beans we grow where we pick them and they bloom more and we pick them and they bloom more. So I wish I had more room where I could dedicate one whole area just to dried beans, but October bean. A pole bean, often with shells as long as 10 inches. 1939 Hall Collection in Cataloochee, North Carolina. October beans or cornfield beans. That was Bus Carpenter sharing that. In Proctor, North Carolina, they said it meant late beans, shelled, that had been shelled out, like I said, draw, dried and then shelled. And that was Lawrence Jones. 1968. Small white beans with a black spot where they were joined to the pod, and that was actually in Brasstown here where I live, Brasstown, North Carolina. So this next one is actually just the word of, O-F, and just shares some different usages of it. So the first one is that it is used for at, on, or in the. So 1939 Hall Collection, Cataloochee, North Carolina, we would gather our apples in of a day and peel our apples of a night and put them out on a scaffold. And that was Mrs. Will Palmer. So that's how I've most commonly heard it, is of an, of an evening, um, of a morning, of a night. So that's the way. That one's still pretty common where I live in Appalachia, at least in the people that I'm around. Uh, they still use it. 1953 Hall Collection, Bryson City, North Carolina. He farmed of a summertime, growed a crop of vegetables, corn, potatoes, etc. And that was Granville Calhoun. 1956 Hall Collection, Big Bend, North Carolina. Mother would get up soon of a morning and get out and work all day. And that was Letha Hicks. 1956, it was documented in the Great Smoky Mountain uh, National Park. 
we'd cook our squirrels of a night over a thing like that out there we cook them of a night you know so that i'll be interested you'll have to tell me if you if that's a usage that you're familiar with of a night of a summertime that one used of an evening of a morning you have to let me know if you if you know that one so this next one's kind of the same, uh, the second entry for it is in of the plus singular noun, at in the 1976, Lindsay, grassy balds, I'd fish of the evening, so of the evening. 1978, Montgomery, white pine, I really enjoy getting out working of the evening. They don't have no one to rely on of the night. So they're just changing. That's just showing the difference. They're still using of, but instead of an or a, they're using the of the night. That one's common here too. Yeah, that one's that one would still be common too. One other one that's under of that seems really common to me. Seems like it would be common everywhere, but it is noted in the dictionary is that um is used to mean from and with respect to. So their example is 1939 Hall Collection. He heard something holler and thought it was a man, but in a few minutes it hollered about 50 yards of him, and that was Sheridan Ware. So that one is still something I might say. Um, I was within 10 yards of him and he screamed and it scared me to death or something like that. So that one though seems like, how else would I say that? I guess you could say I was 10 yards from him, but we would say, well, that's what it, I guess that's what the dictionary says. So I guess that's how you'd say it, but we would say of him. So that's another, that's an interesting one. I'll be interested to see if you, if you would say of him or from him, if you were talking about the distance you were from him. Off down is a prepositional phrase. Hall collection, I come off down into the open woods, Catalucci, North Carolina. Me and Miss, Mr. Steve Woody went on the stands. They jumped the bear and the bear come to the stand where we was at and I give him two good shots and the bear run off down under the mountain. That was Will Palmer, 1973. It was steep off down to the river. The cows would go way off down in them creeks. So off down, that one's just beyond common here. I mean, I don't even know how I would say those examples if I didn't say off down. Off down the bank, off down the road. Um, this morning, something happened just off down the road there. In the steepest part of our driveway, the mail lady got stuck and Matt had to come home and, and pull her out of the ditch. So off down, she was off down in the ditch. Two tires went off down in the ditch and then she was stuck and she couldn't get out. Uh, but Matt saved the day as usual on that one. The next one is often, O-F-F-E-N, often, which means off of, off from. 1924, you look like the buzzards had drug you till you rubbed all the hair off in the back of your head. 1939 Hall Collection. We just broke to it as quick as we could and all went into skinning that bear, scun it all out, took that hide off in it and cut it into four quarter. Now I don't say often, but I've heard people say that. I'm trying to think of who. It's always hard for me to remember. Maybe an older person. Uh, but it seems like it was one of Matt's friends that used to say often. Take it often. He took it often. Like if he was taking, maybe talking about a uh, a cover or something. He took it off and uh, that, you know, before he started using it and didn't put it back on it or something like that. So that one's not one that I hear very often at all. Offer, that's a really common one here to try. So Hall Collection, Emmert's Cove. I didn't offer to kill a rattlesnake and that was Nora Vance. So offer. You might say, I was going down the road this morning and I met him and he didn't even offer to throw up his hand. So offer, that one's really common here for offer. I offered to help and they just wouldn't, they just didn't want my help. They just wouldn't help. Didn't want it. So that, that one's still really common. Uh, to substitute serve the same pu purpose is the, the second portion of that. That kerosene oil offered as a disinfectant. Offered as a disinfectant. Huh. I don't know that I would, I, I don't, I'm not familiar with that, using it like that, but the first one to try is very, very common here. The next one is offish, O-F-F-I-S-H, is unsociable, hard to get to know. It's 1940, it was noted in a glossary, Tennessee 
uh, distant, hard to get acquainted with. 1952, Wilson Folk Speech, shy, not sociable. 1962, colorful tent, offish means unsociable. And then in 1996 and 97, in the Montgomery Collection, it was known to Adams, Brown, Cardwell, Jones, Ledford, Norris, and Oliver. That one's still common here, too, I might say, about somebody. He just, he's really a good person, but he just has an offish personality, so he's hard to get to know. But once you get to know him, he's really, really kind. Off one's mind is an adjective phrase, no longer in one's memory. That one's kind of self-explanatory. I don't remember the dates. It's off my mind. I don't really hear that one. I don't think I've ever heard that one. Off out into. Han, when the wind. Bob, he said, he knew what Eula was doing. She was taking Songboy off out into the fields and singing to him when she had been told better, and he thought of his religion and held in from cussing till he was red in the face from holding. So he was upset. He was holding in his cussing till he was red in the face. But she took the song, took Songboy off out into the fields. Off out into. That one would still be really very common here. So I might say, somebody says, well, where's Matt? I've been looking for him. I don't know where he went. I say, oh, he went off out into the woods. He'll be back after a while. So that one's still really common. Here's a, another uh, interjection that I like. Oh, my country alive. Oh, my country alive. An expression of surprise or disbelief. 1937 Hall Collection, Gatlinburg. Have you fought any forest fires? Oh, my country alive. I fit fires all my life. And that was Lewis Reagan. So I like that. Oh, my country alive. I've never really heard anybody say that one, but I like it. This next one is just oil, O-I-L, and I say it funny, I know, but some people say I'll, I'll instead of oil. I think I try to put more than one syllable in it, but it's just a, a different way of pronouncing it. Um, and that one, some people in my videos have commented that they like to hear me say oil. So maybe I'm, I guess I say it different. So the next one is just old, O-L-D, old. And it just, we use it like conveying a sense of being familiar with something or an attachment. And uh, the dictionary don't really give any examples of it, but some of the, my favorite ones that comes to mind, um, and it is, I mean, it does say that, a degree of being familiar with something or that you're attached or even tenderness towards something but like I might say you know there's a li that little old house that sits right by the uh, road down there I just think it's the prettiest color well it might be an old house but it might be a brand new house but I'm just still saying it's a little old house so there's all kinds of usages like that that we use um, one time me and Paul was talking about it and he was talking about how we can use old to mean like that tenderness like kind of and use it in a way like I was saying about the, the little old house that was sitting there or this little old man down there and he might not really be old he might just be small of stature but say it in a like a loving way a, a, a happy way or a positive light I guess is what I'm trying to say but then sometimes we use it in a negative light like that old so-and-so he's so mean and hateful and again we may not mean that he's old at all we're just referring to him uh, Appalachians are really good at using adjectives and um, adding words whether they're needed or not we want to really describe it we want to be really so descriptive that we leave no doubt in your mind what we're talking about so that's the first one that's just it and then comes this whole slew of the phrases that start with old so old is methuselah's house cat you've probably heard that one and that just means very very old if you're old is methuselah's house cat so I, i've heard that one my whole life i like that one uh, old, I've never heard this one, an old blade. If Matt hears this one, if he watches this video, he'll start calling me that just to tease me. Old blade is a noun, and it says 1967, joking name a man may use for his wife, and that was in Maryville, uh, Tennessee. Old blade, I've never heard that, but if Matt hears it, he'll start calling me old blade just to, just to tease me. Now, this next one I've heard a lot, old bust head. You can kind of, I bet you can already figure out kind of what that one is, old bust head. That is illegal homemade whiskey, especially of an inferior quality, so named from the effect it often has on the head. So, because it leaves you with a busting head. 
old bust head. Uh, 1944, more Tennessee expressions. Poor quality liquor. 1996, Montgomery collection. It was known to Adams, Cardwell, Jones, Letford, Norris, and Oliver. I've never heard this one either. Uh, old consumption is tuberculosis. I've heard to consumption. My papa Wade, they say his mother died of consumption and she had just had a child, so it could have, I mean, who knows? He was 12 when she died, so I'm not sure he, you know, that's all I ever heard him say was that she died from consumption. That's what Pap told me he'd always heard. So um, we're not really sure, but I, every time I hear consumption, I think of her. Of course, I never knew her, but I think about her having this whole house full of kids and just having a new baby and, and all the things that could have been wrong with her. Women in those days, you know, often had kids just right on top of each other and that's that was hard on them and besides how they had had to work so hard so um, anyway old consumption the dictionary saying means tuberculosis foster 1970 foster walker valley roseanne and uncle mose lived till he got 23 and he died of what they called old consumption then which would be tb today the next one is Old Dragon. I've never heard this one either. It's a noun, and that just means the devil. I've never heard the devil called Old Dragon. But it was known to Adams, Bush, and Cardwell in 1997. I like this next one. I've got me a little buddy here. Go away. It's an old field, a noun, an open area that had been or presumably had been cleared and cultivated by Indians and was often left uncultivated by whites and allowed to grow wild because the ground was assumed to be worn out, also a field worn out from constant planting. Because the land was not otherwise used, churches and old field schools were sometimes built on it, same as Indian field, see also old field school. So I've never heard it in relation to uh, the Indians, so that's really interesting. Or even that, uh, I guess maybe that it was wore out, but mostly we would just say people quit using it. They quit using it for pasture, or they quit using it for their garden, or to grow corn, or plant potatoes, or to uh, grow silage, or whatever they were doing. And it was an old field, and it just grew up, because nature, nature will take it back. So that's, that's really interesting. 1913 Morley, Carolina Mountains. The tall, picturesque broom corn that ornaments the landscape, however, is raised to sell the universal sweeping instrument of the mountains made from the broom straw or wild sedge that beautifully takes possession of every old field not yet grown up to bushes. So, uh, broom sage is what we call it. I can't even say sage like that. Sage, broom sage, and it does. Broom sage even today will take over old fields, and it's beautiful growing out there, just kind of floating in the wind this time of the year, especially in the fall. It's not fall yet, but when it gets to be fall, and you can kind of see it in the fall and on into winter when the green dies back, and it's just there kind of shining. It's very pretty. So again, uh, that's they're using the old field just where someone's not uh, using it anymore, but it's not yet grown up to bushes. 1939 Hall Collection, Smokemont, North Carolina. We trailed a bear to some apple trees back down to the Dowdle place and all around them through old fields. And that was Frank Lambert. 1943 Indian days. In many places, white settlers found that the land had long been cleared by the Indians at the head of the New River and on the fertile plains of Teleco, as well as in the Watuga, Hiawassee, and Little Tennessee basins. Settlers encountered these openings. They called them old fields. So that, that one kind of makes it sound like, not that they were wore out, but they were just old fields because somebody, the Indians, the Cherokee, had already done the work for them and left them. Now that one's interesting. Old Field Balsam, the catfoot plant, same as cuddleweed, poverty weed, rabbit tobacco, sweet balsam, sweet everlasting, or tobacco weed. I've never heard it called that. Old, old Field Balsam, Old Field Broom Straw, same as broom sage, we would say. That one uh, makes sense, but I've not heard it. Old Field Pine, a pine tree that commonly grows in an old field. Interesting. Old Field School, an early school built on an old field because it was clear and the ground was presumed to be worn out or otherwise useless for, agri useless for agriculture. So that goes back to that first description. Um, that one's interesting. 
old head, an older person, someone considered to embody the wisdom of the community, 1978 Montgomery White Pine Collection, there's a few but not too many, seems like a lot of the old heads are dead, 1997 Montgomery Collection, known to eight consultants, so I've never heard that elders called old heads, that's interesting, an old lady, Matt calls me his old lady sometimes. A man's wife at any age, often a term of respect. That's what I would say. Some people might get uh, offended by that, but most of the time, if you're saying old lady, or I think the next one's old man, my old man, usually it's kind of said with some, maybe some tongue-in-cheek kind of tenderness or sweetness, like uh, kind of rolling your eyes, but knowing that you're crazy about them and love them. So that one's interesting. 1939 Hall Collection, Bradley Fork, North Carolina. Finally, I lost the old lady seven years ago last January, and that was Aiden Carver. 1969 Medford, Finnis, and he talked and I talked, farming, school, politics, while his old lady worked the house, darting here and there as the gals did some outside chores. And then the next one is old man, a woman's husband at any age, often a term of respect. And then the second part of that, though, is an older man in the community used usually with a man's full name as a term of respect. Old man Dude Hannah, they called him. Dude and Ross Hannah lived in that section you were speaking about. The old man Bud Messer lived right in close to where you were speaking about in that section in there. I've heard Pap use that a whole lot. He might say... Um, Old Man Clay Mason or Old Man Bud Baker, those that one's uh, I heard Pap say. I don't hear anyone saying it today, but Pap would definitely use those. Old Ned, that's another name for the devil. I've heard that one. This also says intro. This is interesting. It says that Old Ned is also means fat pork. Never heard that before. That's from Capeart, our Southern Highlanders. Old Ned is merely slang for fat, fat pork. Hmm. Never heard that one, but I have heard it, the devil. Now, this next one's interesting because I've never heard it either. It's Old Nick, and that was used. No, the first entry is for the devil. Old Nick was the devil. But the second one is illegal homemade whiskey. Now, one of those we read a moment ago that was, was talking about illegal homemade whiskey, it, it said Old Nick, so I, I knew that was probably coming. Old Nick. Old Pete, I never heard this one either, is a noun, and it's starvation. So Mason says, we knew that we could keep Old Pete away as long as we could get a market for our cross ties. So I guess they were making cross ties to sell. Old Pete, starvation, never heard that one. Here's another one for the devil, which is really common, Old Scratch. I've heard that one my whole life too, the devil or the boogeyman. Old timey, or slightly different, but old timey, adjective, characteristic of a former time, old time, 1937 Hall Collection, Emmerts Cove, old timey people called it a cast biler, that was Mrs. Will Schultz, 1970 Mull, Mountain Yarns, horses, mules, and oxen are even a curiosity to see anymore, and autos, tourists, and industry have left very few of the old timey places intact. They, they would certainly agree with that today. That was in 1970, and they were already feeling that. 1973, the old-timey road was right there. I've walked up and down that road. And then 1975, well, they usually sung two or three old-timey songs. So I've heard that one all my life. I use it. You probably do, too. That one's really common. It uh, would seem like it would be common everywhere, but we might, Granny might be telling me about an old-timey chocolate cake or an old-timey bonnet that somebody made or even the old-timey people that used to do this or that. You know, they used to uh, make their kraut this way or cut their wood this way. So that one's, that one's very common. This last one I'll share with you today is a phrase, and I didn't know it until many years ago when I was researching for the blind pig and the acorn. I read it actually in this dictionary, and I've always loved it ever since. Old woman is losing her feathers, or old woman is picking her geese. Got a little plane going over. towards Andrews, maybe to the airport. 
So the old woman is losing her feathers or the old woman is picking her geese. And that means it's snowing, large flakes. 1931 calms, large southern highlanders. The old woman's a losing her feathers. Snow is falling. The old woman's a picking her geese. Snow is falling. 1952 brown, North Carolina folklore. The old woman is picking her geese. It is snowing. 1997 Montgomery collection. The old woman is picking her geese known to nine consultants. So old woman is losing her feathers. That's something I love to see. The past two years, we've not hard, had hardly any snow. I'm crazy. I'm plum foolish about snow. I just love it. Um, if I lived somewhere where it snowed all the time and it was, you know, two or three feet at a time, I probably wouldn't like it as much as I do. But it's when, when it snows in the southern Appalachia region, region everything kind of st stops and and it, our snow doesn't last long. It's rare for it to last more than, you know, a couple of days as far as if it's a big snow and makes making a lot of problems for the roads and stuff uh, because our weather quickly changes and usually it melts off. We here on the north side of the mountain, it'll stay around our houses, around back here in the garden or on our driveway because the sun don't, sh don't hit it very much. Um, but it's not something, we don't have a lot of snow, in other words, what I'm trying to say. In the last two winters, we've had hardly any and I just love it. It just every it just makes it's like a holiday feeling when it snows for me. Pap used to tell me he didn't like for it to snow because he still had to get out and work. And he said I wouldn't I wouldn't be wishing it would if if I was the one having to drive a big truck in the snow and those kind of things. And he was right, I'm sure. But I still just get all giddy and excited, just like I'm nine years old running back to uh, the front. I would always run to the front door in Granny and Pap's house. Their kitchen door has a has glass at the top, and I would peek out, out the wind, out the glass to see if it had snowed and turn on the porch light. I still feel just like that. I get so excited. When I worked at the college for many years, a lot of times they would be, you know, if, if it snowed because it was a school, they would either call off the um, day or, or at least have a two-hour delay or something like that. So my buddies that worked with me there, we would often... If, if it, one of us, whoever got up first and seen that it had snowed, we would we'd call the others to say it snowed. Maybe we'll get out of work or maybe we'll, we'll ha get a two-hour delay and have a little bit of extra time at home. But mostly I just love the beauty of it. It's just nothing like walking in the a wood, woods with snow. I mean, it's just soft and everything's quiet and everything's beautiful. Snow hides everything. You know, it's just, oh, it's just so beautiful. I'm plum foolish about it. I love to be out in it. I love to sled, love to make snowmen. And then I love to go in and have hot chocolate and sit around the wood stove and uh, drip dry from being out in the snow. It's just something I am plum foolish about. I'm also plum foolish about talking about Appalachian language. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please leave a comment and tell me which of these words and phrases you're familiar with and which of the ones you've never heard. And as always, I hope you'll just keep dropping back by often to help me celebrate Appalachia.